thank you. Oh, thank you, Kyohon. So you heard my name. My name is Esther, and I'd like to introduce some villas. Camille is American. He traveled extensively, seen a lot of architecture. He is an, an architect and he um, worked for about 10 years professionally and he taught for about 10 years, including in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in Italy, Florence, Italy, in Copenhagen, Denmark. And he's also what I call a little bit an expert on American modernism. He and his wife have a beautiful collection of Eames furniture and other stuff at his home. And he writes books. So that's what I said to my students today. And then they said, every architect writes books. And then I thought, hmm, maybe they're right. But he writes beautiful books. I thought, and then I thought, hmm, how do I explain that? What is a beautiful book? And then I thought, I need to kind of a good story for that. And so the good story is he wrote this book, for example, I have those books here that, he, that I possessed by him from him, this book on William Burster. And I was sitting looking through this book, and then I said, oh my god, are those drawings beautiful? And then his wife, Jen, turned around, pretty relaxed, and said, Tom did be. And then I thought, wow, he knows what he's doing, and he knows the content of his book. And so this is this, this other book he will talk about today, Modern School. Tom Hill visited all these schools in this book, which is, um, what, which is quite remarkable, I think. 80% of the photos are by him I learned yesterday. And um, then I thought, what else can I tell about him? And then I thought, maybe I tell how it all came that he comes here, or that he is here. It was Friday, April 22nd, 7 o'clock in the morning, 7.30, I was in the hallway just getting ready to go to Germany, pack my last things, and I went into Christine, and then I, an hour later I had, a meeting, had had a meeting with her, decided that I will teach an architectural terminal studio, I had decided that I will teach a studio in school. And I had called Tom Hille, and luckily he's an early bird, you know, I, was ta I just needed, I, I knew I need to finish that right away. So I called him at 8 o'clock in the morning and said, hey Tom, I'm teaching a studio in school, can you come and do a workshop or a lecture? And I don't know how I will pay you, I have no budget at this point, I just need a little bit of a, a foundation. And he said, yeah, we can do that, I live in Seattle. And don't worry about the budget, it will work out fine. <laughs> and so since then, this collaboration is a little bit like that. It's short, precise, convincing, and pleasant. And um, that he's here now and teach, uh, teaches the studio and libraries for the Sustainable City Initiative is because he's currently writing a book on libraries, public libraries. He can tell you more about that if you like. For now, I look forward to this lecture. My students do, I know that. We had a long field trip day today, so we are all pretty tired. And um, for the near future, I look forward to eight good weeks of collaboration. And um, in the long run, I hope that he will be here again and give a lecture on libraries. Please join me in welcoming Tom here. Thanks for that nice introduction. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, as Esther said, uh, I've just completed a fairly comprehensive survey of modern schools. And the reason I got interested in that is because I was designing schools. And um, I, I'm always interested in precedents for my design work as a way to inspire and inform it. And I, I was finding very little, actually, at the time this was probably 10 or 12 years ago, something like that. And uh, so I started a, a kind of informal survey and got more and more into it and found more and more interesting things. And uh, it ended up being this book. And I'd like to share with you just a few examples tonight of things that I found. Uh, some of them are probably things you've seen before, but maybe not in such depth. Uh, others. I don't know, maybe, maybe something altogether different. Uh, I should preface this. Uh, this was a historical survey, but I'm not a historian by any stretch. I'm a designer. And so I have different motives for looking at things. And 
I have to be very careful because sometimes, you know, designers design things if they can't find the information, and that's not a good way to be if you're a historian. So, um, I, I hope I haven't done too much of that in this book. Uh, next thing I'd like to say about schools in general to be aware of as we go through these, if you haven't designed them, they're very messy, and uh, they're they're everyday environments. They're not art museums or churches or you know pristine, fixed, unchanging places that are kept the way they were originally designed. Schools are, are very different, and they're very challenging because of that. They're also challenging because, well, they have limited budgets. They have complex user groups, uh, client groups. Uh, code restrictions are extensive. Uh, there are a lot of things that, um, that make schools difficult. At the same time, um, it's a really interesting project type. Because if you, like me, if you think architecture has the capability to show you something about the world to a kind of didactic function, if you will, then what better project type to design than a school, which is about learning? So um, with, with that in mind, I'd like to kind of jump into a couple of educational issues. I also, also should tell you I'm not an educational expert. I teach occasionally. but educational theory and practice is something that I get indirectly through my design work. Is that okay? Yeah, so um, modern schools, a lot of people ask me, so how do you define a modern school? And I define a modern school uh, as a school that a facility uh, that supports the modern educational program. And it's interesting because the modern educational program uh, developed about the same time that modernism in architecture developed, the beginning of the 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, there's a, a convergence, a confluence of ideas here that I think are somewhat reciprocal and build on one another. Uh, here are some of the, the uh, ideas that come out of the modern educational program related to educational theory. And um, today, I think most of these are not so controversial if you see them as being uh, supplemental to traditional education, which is more knowledge-based with a teacher standing at the front of the class. There's still a place for that, and it still happens in all schools. Uh, I think most educators accept that today. But these are things that diversify that experience that make it broader and richer and um, lead to all kinds of possibilities architecturally. Those are translated into educational practices and methods, and this isn't a comprehensive listing. This is sort of my shorthand for things that I've come across dealing with educators. Uh, if you're in architecture school, you'll recognize a lot of these architectural education Today is a great example of this sort of uh, progressive learning. And those then translate into what I call design themes. And these are uh, concepts that I've developed with users and clients and teachers and students um, working on real buildings to try and understand what your underlying goals are for a project. Uh, some of these have been around forever, like a traditional school. We all know it, you know, a two or three story red brick schoolhouse with double loaded corridors, uh, classrooms, you know, aligned along either side. Uh, traditionally, 28 by 32 feet was the dimension. And uh, they had high windows, 15 feet, because that was the only source of, of lighting in a classroom at that time. You sat facing with the windows on your left because you were right-handed and you needed natural light coming across this way. And if you weren't right-handed, you were doing it wrong and you should change that. And there was a teacher that stood at the front of the class on a raised platform and imparted knowledge to you. And there was a lot, lot of uh, re remote, <laughs> sorry, rote memorization and um, you know, just a different way of learning from the kinds of things that are done today in schools. 
So I'd like to start now. I'm going to try and show you four or five schools. We'll see how far we get into it. We can stop at any time. But um, these I've sorted out according to what I'm calling design paradigms. They're, they're like concepts that begin to take into account some of the design themes uh, that, that I just showed you. Um, I'm going to start in the late 20s with uh, Jan Dwyker, who was a Dutch architect, uh, a modernist, a, a self-proclaimed functionalist. Uh, he died rather young, uh, but managed to complete a handful of really important buildings uh, that are still, I think, useful to look at today. This is one of his most important buildings. It's a very small school, pretty modest in size. Uh, Jan Dwyker believed that architecture had a unique ability to redeem people's lives through health and hygiene. And it's an interesting thing to think about. He was uh, designing in an era when tuberculosis, especially, was a big problem in urban areas. And um, are, are any of you familiar with the open air school movement? Uh, I'll Lester students. Uh, the open air school movement uh, began around 1907 or 1908 in Germany, and it was a treatment for kids with early signs of tuberculosis. And they had outdoor classrooms all year long where kids would study to get the treatment of uh, natural light, sunlight, um, fresh air, and uh, exercise. And they studied in little sleeping bags. It's quite remarkable, actually. These were hugely popular, and they spread all over northern Europe. They came to the United States. This school is not one of the official uh, open-air schools associated with that organization. This is a school that was started with the idea that if that works for kids with tuberculosis, wouldn't it be great if healthy kids could also have uh, access to that sort of educational environment. Uh, this is a um, site plan on the left and floor plans on the right. The site is South Amsterdam, which was being developed at the time. This is a housing block that surrounds the school that sits at the center. And it was actually selected as a site because it was inexpensive. But he capitalizes on that location in a number of ways that I'll show you as we go through. Uh, the main classroom block then is that freestanding form in the middle here. And it's uh, four stories in height and completely protected and enclosed by the perimeter of uh, housing around it. There's an entry gate at this end that comes into the courtyard. The uh, classroom building itself has two classrooms on each floor with an outdoor classroom in between. And the outdoor classroom is, is used for all kinds of activities, both active and passive, shared by those two classrooms on that floor. In addition, you have an outdoor play area that surrounds the school that's protected from the noise and uh, activity of the city. And on the ground floor then, you also have a small gymnasium that extends off on this side. Everything about this school tries to connect you to the out of doors, to the sunlight, to the fresh air, and to these uh, activity spaces around the school. It's oriented on the diagonal to maximize exposure to the classrooms. Classrooms have five sides, as you can see here. Uh, from the outside, the open air classroom here, and paired classrooms on either side. Uh, that's the gateway that you see on the left that enters in. Originally, that was a caretaker's house and the principal's house with a, a workshop for students on the spanning element in between this kind of bridge space here. Uh, it's since been converted to the kindergarten, which works quite well. I think that happened probably in the 1950s. Uh, the building has been reclad. It used to be uh, a much lighter uh, framework for the uh, enclosure system, but this, the, the essential idea is still basically there.
That's the gymnasium on the left that you can see opening out to the backyards of the, the housing block around it. Uh, incredibly light and airy space that opens directly out onto the playground. You can see on the uh, landing here as you come into the school, uh, the detailing, those are the heating pipes for the building that you hang your coat on. So your coat is dried out by the time you go home at the end of the day. Yeah, we do need that. Uh, each paired class, uh, set of paired classrooms on each floor has um, a toilet facility so that you have the autonomy of that floor so you don't have to go up and down the stairs. You can see additional coat racks with the heating elements there and then the classrooms off to either side. Here you can see the way it's protected inside the space here of the block. And then the classrooms themselves have glazing on four out of five sides with a teaching wall on the fifth side, full height glazing to maximize sunlight and fresh air. And then the, the blinds that you can see you can pull down for some solar protection. On the right, you can see the outdoor classroom on one of the upper floors with visual connections back. So there's an invitation constantly to sort of extend both visually and physically to the outdoor space. Uh, there was a, an American architect who reported on this building, I think in the early 30s, in one of the architectural journals who said, it looks like an x-ray of a building instead of a building. And I think what he's done here is he's effectively turned the school inside out to, to reach his objectives. And you can see it also extends up to the roof. There are roof terraces as well, so classrooms at that level that look out over the playground and the entire neighborhood. And then you can see the kind of activities that are constantly going on around the school with you know, strong visibility that sort of attracts you to those outdoor spaces. Uh, the next school I'm going to show you is an American school, and this is probably the most famous American school ever designed. Uh, it was a unique collaboration between Eliel and Eero Saarinen. Eero Saarinen had just graduated from Yale School of Architecture. And Perkins, Wheeler, and Will, soon to become Perkins and Will, Larry Perkins was really the person that did the programming on this. The Saarinens were the designers. And uh, there's a third person, Carlton Washburn, who was a progressive educator who happened to be the superintendent of Winnetka School District at the time, north of Chicago. And um, he is the one that had the idea of the child-centered education, which translates to the child-centered school. Child-centered education says that instead of the child conforming to the educational program, it should be the other way around that the child is at the center of everything in the school. And everything in this school tries to be oriented in that direction. The sort of hearth or the center of the, the school in this case is the classroom, which at that time was uh, a fairly unique idea, uh, especially the way he looks at it, uh, Carlton Washburn looks at it as a kind of residential context or domestic context. The idea being that the classroom is your home away from home, the class is a family with the teacher at its head, and it's a self-contained unit. Uh, Washburn thought that small children especially couldn't cognitively deal with the larger size of a school, uh, an entire school of, of this scale. And so the classrooms which you can see aligned here, here, and the kindergartens here. These are the primary, these are the intermediate classrooms. Uh, they have a certain amount of autonomy. You can see this sort of repetitive rhythm with alternating courtyards. The classroom really focuses on diversified activities. So there's a teaching wall, so you can do traditional teaching with a large group. There's also a breakout space for doing uh, team projects. Uh, all of the walls are tackable wall surface for putting up work so you can see uh, what, what kids are, are actually generating. Most interesting is a little side 
workshop that extends off and makes it an L-shaped classroom that then contains the courtyard that faces southeast on one side and southwest on the other side of the building. That L-shaped classroom then accommodates all kinds of things that a normal classroom, just a single you know, 30 by 30 square foot classroom would be able to do. Uh, there's also a, a glazed corner that's like a bay window that has uh, teaching blocks that are stored in the, the base and also is used as a storytelling area. All of this was pretty radical at the time. And access to the school uh, came directly into the classroom originally. Directly into the classroom through these courtyards up until about 20 years ago when for security reasons they finally stopped doing that. But the idea was these were like houses just in the neighborhood context. And so for school identity, there's a whole new idea here that the school is no longer this civic monument. It's something that is lower, quieter, that blends in with the neighborhood, that's more child scaled. This is the front of the school. On the left is the main entrance. And um, I, I think it's a fairly stately and dignified uh, image that you get of the school, but it's also pretty friendly and low in scale. Uh, this is the primary wing on this side that has a play area that opens out on the front side uh, for easy access for uh, drop off. And then inside, the main, uh, main hallway is like a living room. And it's used as a multi purpose space all day long by parents and kids and classes. Uh, it's, today, it's used also for a lunchroom. But originally, Washburn thought all children should go home at lunch. That, that was, again, part of the, the association of uh, the home-like environment. Uh, this is the Aeroceranon designed uh, auditorium, which has gradated seat sizes that move toward the front and become smaller. And uh, the furniture throughout the school is very carefully calibrated to the size of the child. Uh, this is the kindergarten. On the left, uh, this is a, a kind of playhouse thing. But again, you, you get a sense of the domestic quality of the space, the low ceilings compared to what previously was 15 feet typically. And a lot of that was already dictated by code. So it had to be changed to do this school. This is the main entrance to on the back side of the kindergarten area with a little porch area for drop off. And then the classroom wings that look something like this. Again, this repetition of alternating court, entry courtyard that also accommodates outdoor activities, which you can see in the right-hand slide. And then the corner bay window that uh, projects out toward the south. And inside the really lovely classroom spaces, the, uh, all of the interiors are um, Oregon pine, interesting and uh, is stained but left unfinished otherwise. So it's uh, self-healing. It's tackable wall surface everywhere. Uh, incandescent lights, 300 watt incandescent lights that were uh, specially designed for the school. And you can see here in the corner window the storage that accommodates these blocks that are still used today. These are the original uh, learning blocks. Uh, you can see here the uh, toilet facility in the back, and again, a home needs a toilet, a bathroom. You don't have it down the hall where you have to send kids and you don't see them again. Everything is sort of localized to the classroom level. This is a teaching wall on the left. And if you notice the height of the teaching wall, it's kid height. It's not adult height. Uh, the chair is there because the teacher has to sit, has to come down to the, the size of, of the child to be able to write on the chalkboard. All of the door handles in the school are down at kid height. It's uh, pretty, pretty uh, consistent the way that's worked through the school. You can see the tackable wall surface here that uh, lines the primary school wing. And the hallway's oversized so that activities can spill outside the classroom for individual instruction, that sort of thing. The next school I want to show you is uh, also an American school. It's on the West Coast this time. 
by Richard Neutra. Uh, Richard Neutra uh, was a well-known modernist, best known for his uh, modern houses from the 30s, 40s, and 50s in Southern California, which were iconic of that era. He also did a lot of schools, uh, initially uh, on his own and then with his son Dion, and later with Robert Alexander, who was his uh, partner for doing larger public projects. Neutra uh, also was very much interested in inside and outside connections in schools. For him, however, it was more related to connections to nature rather than health and hygiene. He was also very much aware of health and hygiene as issues. But Neutra, who had studied uh, it, at university uh, in psychology, uh, was very much interested in the physiological and psychological relationships that uh, relate people to nature. And he felt that without connections to nature, you really couldn't have a healthy environment. He was fortunate to live in Southern California where the climate is very forgiving and allows a lot of outdoor living to go on. This particular school uh, that I, I like very much is on the campus at UCLA uh, in Los Angeles and uh, was, was developed over about a five-year period in a couple of, uh, a couple of phases. Uh, there was an original school that existed here and here. That was actually done by Robert Alexander earlier. Neutra added three wings. This one is the nursery kindergarten. This one, I'm afraid I'm dying here a little bit. Uh, this one is a cluster building for uh, primary and second, primary and intermediate level. And this is uh, a California finger plan extension. Do you know what a finger plan is? It's a pavilion school that has uh, classroom wings with intervening courtyards and a circulation linkage that, that ties them together, oriented ideally north and south for natural light. You find them all over California, and Neutra was instrumental in developing that type. Um, so this is an experimental school that's used for teaching. And so they wanted to have these different ways of organizing classrooms to experiment with. Uh, we'll start with uh, the, element, the uh, nursery school uh, kindergarten, which is oriented along the access road here and opens out into a natural ravine. The natural ravine was existing, and uh, the principal, who is a woman named Corinne Seeds, was also a pro progressive educator, was very much interested in hands-on learning and wanted that connection to this natural area uh, to turn it into a learning environment. So the school sort of spans that and flanks it on either side. Uh, this is the, the entrance to the kindergarten and uh, nursery school. As you can see, has kind of a hard closed edge on the outside to protect that natural space on the inside of the site. Pass through this passage on the right. And the classrooms are aligned facing east in this case, out into this outdoor area. You can, you can see the, the sort of learning equipment just sort of literally spilling out into this area. And they encourage that. It's, it's used for that purpose. You know, I should probably mention here, uh, I would love to have kids, photographs of kids in these photographs, but you know that's forbidden these days. You're not allowed to do that. So you really have to kind of accept uh, these sort of indications of habitation and how the space is used. It's the only way you can document it unless you stage it with actors. But um, in this case, I think it gives a pretty good sense of how it is actually used, and it's pretty, uh, pretty vigorously. Uh, uh, kind of trademark features of Neutra's schools. He has a sliding window wall that opens the classroom up, oh, maybe 12 to 16 feet in most cases. And the classroom almost becomes like an ancillary uh, porch to the main activity space, which is outside. Um, you can also see here a built-in work counter, and that has a sink and storage. So they actually have workstations outside for doing projects uh, that are directly related to these outdoor spaces. Looking into the classroom then, 
Uh, the original lighting was up down pendants much, much nicer than this. I don't know why they changed that out. And then looking back toward the outside, you can see the visual connection despite all the stuff that we put in classrooms. Um, unfortunately, the finger plan wing of this uh, school has been torn down about 10 years ago for an extension of the management school, which is adjacent. These are Julia Schulman's photographs of it originally. And you can see that these outdoor classrooms are much more controlled and uh, kind of tightly formed than the younger children. You can begin to see these as, as outdoor classrooms where more structured uh, learning goes on. And then the open canopy that connects them. Throughout the school, you have these open passageways that are constantly putting you in connection to the landscape. Uh, on the right is uh, the, the entrance hall into uh, the, this kind of uh, flex space at the center of uh, four classrooms for shared breakout use. On the left is um, the exterior of those classrooms opening out onto the terraces. And then on the right is the lunchroom. And it's as simple as that, you know, under the redwood trees and the sycamores, you bring out some picnic tables and they bring out carts with lunch. And, and that's how they do it. They actually planned a lunchroom for this school that, that was never built because they decided they didn't need it. And when it's raining, they eat in the classrooms because that's a rare case. The next school I'm going to show you is in Germany by Hans Scherun. Hans Scherun was one of the great German modernists, probably the most important following the Second World War. He stayed in Germany during the war uh, and had very little work, but was well positioned afterwards to do some very important public buildings, uh, the most famous of which is the Berlin Philharmonie. Uh, this school was done about the time he was working on the Philharmonie. Sharoon's idea about schools was that the most important thing they needed to achieve was to teach children how to associate with one another, how to socialize. And he, he felt that this was something that was difficult to teach indirectly and was easiest to teach by direct experience. He's one of the first architects to think of the school as a, a microcosm of the community, as, as a smaller version of the community that kids operate in, learn how to do certain things, and then go back out into the real world. And that's how he formulates his school. Sharoon was a functionalist, but he's an organic functionalist. So he has very free form uh, shapes and, and systems that he works with that allow him to be much more responsive to aspects of the program in sight. Uh, I think it's probably most, sorry, the most important space in the school is this central corridor, which is actually an expanded hallway that's used as a break hall. It's, it's really an unprogrammed space aside from circulation. It has no other formal use but it has all kinds of places to be, ways to interact with people. Along its length, you get the science rooms, which are shared spaces that everyone in the school uses. So it's like the most public space. That's, that uh, interior street parallels the outside street here. Uh, it also has, along one end, uh, the assembly hall. And the shape of the assembly hall is centralized so that you sit together as an equal group instead of the way we're organized here, like a 19th century classroom with me at the front. Here you sit together collectively looking at each other as well as the person that's talking. That can be open and connected to the hallway here, so it can also be used informally during the day. Then the classroom wings branch off of that. This is the primary. This is the intermediate off to the right here. Classrooms are organized uh, facing south for natural light. They have an outdoor space that serves as an outdoor classroom. Inside the classroom itself is like a splayed rectangle. 
And you can see that he's showing different layouts uh, for how that classroom can be used in a traditional lecture format or can be used more like a centralized space for um, sitting and, and working together as a group. This is a music room that was not built, but it sits on the outside of this um, community outdoor space that's related to the break hall. The break hall opens directly out to that. Uh, within the classroom, there's a little entry vestibule, then the main classroom, and then there's a little breakout study area, and then the outdoor classroom. So like Crow Island, it has four or five different spaces within the classroom that can be used in different ways. This is uh, the way the school looked three or four years ago. It's now being renovated uh, by the state to put it back in its original condition. This is pretty close to it, but it's pretty tired. Uh, it does have a second floor that has special use spaces that have outlook over the, the playground and the street on the other side. Those are art rooms and crafts rooms, things like that. Uh, this is the auditorium, the hall that you see at the end. And that opens out into this common courtyard. On the other side, it opens to a pathway that connects back to the community for after hours use. Community use is a big deal in this school as it is in most modern schools. There you see this pedestrian uh, pathway that, that cuts toward the center of town. This is directly off it for nighttime use. Inside this kind of uh, multi-configured space that gives you different ways you can set up that's the stage at this end that opens directly out and back to the hallway. Uh, this is the central break hall with these kind of sub, sub areas off to the side that give you places to stop and be. The library opens off of this, as you can see here. Um, originally, there was a window wall to the front of the school at the far end. That's going to be restored in the the renovation, which will be nice. And then moving into the classroom wings, again, this idea that uh, Sharon calls them classroom dwellings. And he, um, he sees this as a, an interior street with a kind of showcase that the students can put uh, projects and so forth out for display to the school. Passing through that, then, the classroom on one side and then moving straight through to the outdoor classroom on the other. Classrooms are really beautifully designed for natural light. And you know, for sustainability, uh, natural light is something that has always been important in schools since day one. Even very traditional 19th century schools had to have natural light. And it, and it carries forth to today. But uh, Shroon is, is especially adept at this. Uh, it's multilateral light that comes from all directions in the clear story, and then the big view windows that open out to the southeast, in this case, to the, um, to the, the outdoor classroom. Uh, this is the small work area in back that you can see is they, the teacher gets it. It's set up like it's a dining room or a, a side room in a house. And then the outdoor classrooms that um, at the time I, I visited the school, uh, the last time I visited, these were being tended by the, the students themselves. So they were taking care of their own. It was kind of an, an outdoor learning project, uh, tending to these, these little courtyard gardens. Uh, th there is a second floor of classrooms above the break hall, and that's for the older students go up to um, sixth or seventh grade, I think. Sharoon's idea here was that as you got older, you needed to begin to prepare yourself for the next move, which is going out into the community. So he raises those classrooms up so that they have this outlook over the school and then out to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the next school that I'll show you is by Herman Hertzberger. And I call this the interactive school because Hertzberger believes that interactivity in the facility of the school is essential to the learning experience. And it comes from the Montessori uh, method, which is something Hertzberger is very familiar with. I understand he was educated 
uh, to that system. His wife also taught in a Montessori school. And um, the Montessori program is very much about hands-on learning and auto-learning or self-learning, um, putting out materials in a way, classroom materials, learning materials in a way that they're attractive and kids want to go and explore and learn on their own. So there's a, a very strong individual basis to the educational process. Hertzberger takes this uh, into the classroom, but also moves out into the more public areas of the school and even to the site, uh, looking for ways that the, the, the physical environment can entice you to sort of engage and interact with it. Uh, this is the Apollo Lane School in Amsterdam from 1983. It was actually started in the mid-70s and is uh, not too far from Hertzberger's uh, other great influence, which is uh, the Van Tien School that's about half a mile away from this. Um, also, it's the, it's the, the primary school um, uh, classrooms for this school is just on a different site. But uh, working on multiple levels then, these are two schools co-located on one site. One is a Montessori school, which is this one, and the other is a normal public school, but organized in a very similar way. It only has a few minor uh, differences in it. Uh, the school is organized on each level with two classrooms on each side around a central atrium space. The atrium space is a tiered seating area that will seat the entire student body of the school. But it's rarely used for that. That's a special occasion thing. Uh, it's sort of in the middle of the school most of the time. And uh, it's used for a whole variety of things. You can just sit down on it and talk to your friends, or you can do projects on it. They use them like desks. Uh, it's, it's quite a versatile space. Hersberger believes you get flexibility in a school by making fixed things that are multivalent that can be used in different ways, not by neutralizing space and making it empty because you don't know how to inhabit that. And so his, I find his forms to be very intensive. They're almost overpacked in a way because he's looking for ways to get more in to get that sort of, um, that sort of effect. On the site, there's an open space here and there's an open space here that he sees as kind of interstitial spaces where the public comes into the school and begins to have some interaction with uh, the school itself. Those two schools come together in this central space, so there's an overlap, and that has an outdoor play structure. There are also sandboxes that are built in here that have a kind of hands-on building aspect to them. And you can see in section the stepping that moves kind of back and forth up to the top of the building. They're very compact and um, centralized around this, this uh, atrium space. Um, on the site then, you can see the freestanding blocks of the two schools. And he sees these as, um, as kind of villas, like the houses in the neighborhood. And they're scaled about like the, the houses in this part of town or apartment buildings, I should say, in this part of town. Spaces that bring you into the entry, which you can see here. The kindergarten is at ground level and is somewhat separate. And then you rise up one half level to the uh, main floor of the school where the uh, amphitheater is located. Inside, then, this sort of cavernous space where light comes in from above. It's like an outdoor space. Uh, his school at, at Delft, he, he does a similar thing only with a kind of linear organization that's like a street. And here you can see the corner where the uh, classroom begins to have this, what uh, Hertzberger calls zone of exchange, which term he gets from Aldo van Eyck, that's looking at the public zone of the hall beginning to interact with the more private zone of the classroom. And those are really well used. Uh, and, and I think they're interesting because they can be used for a lot of different things. You can see uh, students working together. In this case, they're also, some of them have been transformed into uh, computer stations, and they work great for that, even though they didn't have, 
personal computers in schools at the time this was built. Uh, one of the problems with Hertzberger's school, I think, uh, he loves to do uh, these hard exposed finishes inside. Uh, the concrete block here, it's, it's a nice concrete block, but you can't tack on it. You can't pin anything up on it. And that's a real problem for a modern school because you want to be able to show student work. He's good at doing shelves and those sorts of things, but uh, not so much the tackable wall surfaces. As you move up higher than toward the light, you can see these within the public zone overlooking this central space, all kinds of little spaces that attract you. You can break out and do individual or small group work. Uh, and then rooftop access, so you do have a more private outdoor space. The top of the school, the library is also up at this level. And those are uh, well-used spaces as well. Uh, going into the classroom then, this is also a modified L-shaped classroom that Hertzberger likes very much. He likes it because it breaks down the centralized nature of the classroom. It's very hard to meet in these classrooms as a large group uh, because it's, it's a fragmented space. Um, there's a, a, there was a teacher who told me that this window here she really disliked because she was telling Hertzberger this when he was visiting the school once that she really disliked it because no matter who was sitting there, they were always looking out the window. And he said, I knew they would do that. <laughs> and it's this kind of subversive attitude breaking down the hierarchy and centralization of the classroom. You can meet there as a class and you can have traditional instruction, but it's not the preferred means for the Montessori school, which is what this is. And I, I love this image at the front entry with the display cases that, that show the the goods, the uh, Hertzberger loves to use these Dutch doors that allow you to open above but keep a sense of privacy and separation below. And then the bay windows that project outward. In the Montessori school only, there's also what he calls a kitchen unit, which is a work sink and counter that's built in in the outside corner of the classroom. Again, it disrupts the centrality of the space and really kind of forces it to break down into subzones. And that's a fixed piece. It doesn't move. It, it will always be there. So there's a real commitment uh, at some level that that's how the space will be used. And then finally, you can see uh, the, the built-in shelves in the window, the, the, the display of learning tools, if not student work, that's uh, a part of the Montessori method. Um, I want to leave time for a question and answer here, so I'll just move quickly through a couple of other examples just to, to kind of show you the range of things here. Uh, Christian Kanzi is going to be here soon talking about Banish's work, and I hope he shows some of the schools, because I think they're some of the best that have ever been uh, designed. Um, Banish I call the situational school because he talks about architecture, his architecture being a response to the situations of the site and the program, and an intense articulation of those situations that create additional situations that he responds to, and it feeds on itself and builds on itself. The schools themselves are um, very open and interconnected as, as learning spaces, and that's, that's fully intentional as a kind of expression of freedom and individualism that allows you to move about in kind of different and, and less restricted ways. This is uh, the Hauptschule, sorry for my pronunciation, auf dem Schafferfeld in Lorsch, Germany. Uh, Banish did four buildings on this site. This one was from 1981 that uh, Christian worked on himself. I think he was project architect on this. And it's uh, I think a really pivotal project for Banish that kind of opened up a lot of possibilities. What's characteristic about it is it's a hall school, which has a two-story school with classrooms around the perimeter and a central shared hall space that's a multi-use space. And uh, in, in Banish's case, he almost always uses a very geometric form that orders the school as the classrooms that kind of hovers up above and then he begins to fragment and break and connect to the site. And the, it is quite amazing the, 
the level of freedom of architectural expression that you get is, uh, would be very hard to achieve, I think. But uh, he, he always seems to manage. Uh, this is the central hall and the main entrance on the left with the classrooms oriented on the southeast and southwest sides facing outward with direct connection into the central hall. And that's a really dynamic space during the day. It's constantly got kids moving through it. This is the prow of the, of the school on the south side that you can see the articulation on the outside of the classrooms. What I love about these schools is every classroom in the school is completely unique in terms of its position, in terms of its outlook, in terms of its shape. It, there's just this desire to infuse at all levels of the school this kind of openness and freedom that uh, he wants to translate down to the activities that occur there. Uh, John and Patricia Packow, I don't know if you know their schools up in British Columbia, but um, I call them the circumstantial school because they talk about in their work a response to the circumstances of the site in the program, but looking more not only at the physical context, but also the historical and the cultural and the things that make the sense of place um, identifiable and special. The Strawberry Vale School from the mid-90s uh, happens to, it was a site of an older school, actually two older schools, so it's the third on this site, uh, that runs along the edge of a remnant community, uh, an oak savanna that's unique to this part of the Pacific Northwest and up into Canada. And they wanted to preserve that, the community wanted to preserve that, and express that as part of their cultural heritage. So the whole school is organized around this, um, this natural environment that happens on the south side of the school here. The classrooms are all organized um, on that side so they have direct access and they're sort of loosely following the terrain of the uh, topography moving along the south edge. The public sides of the building then open out toward the community on the north side of the school with the gymnasium on the left, administration in the center. There you can see the view from the classroom. These classrooms also have bay windows like Crow Island that are kind of breakout areas where you can have quiet activities, small groups. And then the, the rock ledge that runs along uh, that south side of the building. And you can see the way the building kind of steps and moves with that rather than fighting against it. There's kind of a central hallway zone that splays outward that mediates then between the the kind of natural side of the site and the man-made side of the site. Uh, that's the front of the school and then the central hallway. And today, that's a, that's a soon after construction photograph. That's not my photograph, but it's much more inhabited today. This is also all tackable wall surface, so they can decorate the walls with their class materials. Uh, last one I'll touch on just briefly. Uh, Morphosis has done a number of schools, all of which were won through competition, which allows them a certain flexibility, shall we say, dealing with clients and so forth. Uh, these are pretty controversial schools among uh, school designers, but I think they're really astonishing for what they're able to accomplish architecturally. And I think they do have uh, some motives that are legitimately educational. Um, the one I'm going to show you here is Diamond Ranch High School, which is near Pomona, out in the desert. Uh, originally, the, the brief for the competition wanted a gateway to the town. And the architect said, there's nothing here to be a gateway to. This building should disappear. It should be a non-building that recedes into the landscape. It was a seismically unstable hillside. And the first move they did was put in the retaining walls to stabilize the hillside, and then they started to inhabit those. So they moved kind of down into the ground and then built up from there with a geometric roof that shifted and sort of set up other uh, options for inhabitation, the upper levels. It's organized around a central street 
that has almost a kind of geological form to it. It's like a canyon almost. Tom Main is interested in what he calls the critical interstitial spaces between public and private, between building and landscape, between the school and the community. And these kind of high profile architectural spaces are found in all of his schools. And that's where the architectural action is, and that's where he thinks the social action should be as well. Uh, this is raised above the level of uh, the parking area here through a kind of elaborate series of, of stairs that climb up to that. There's a separation in the other direction between the community use spaces at this end and the academic spaces at the other end. Uh, that's the main entrance on the left to the administration building. And the classrooms for uh, Tom Main are utilitarian functional spaces. They're not the center of the school. He sees that as a workspace. They're, they're fine. Uh, they have some natural light, but it's not uh, incredible natural light. It's a place where you go to do your work, and you, you get out as soon as you can, and you go to the places where the real action is, which are these kind of big dramatic spaces that link back to the rest of the school and the community. Again, unfortunately, I can't show those with kids in them, but they are flooded once every hour, and they have lunch out on these terraces. It's, uh, it's a pretty nice space views out to the landscape. So uh, I've kind of touched on a, a lot of different design themes, you know, going through these paradigms. And uh, there are a few, that, a couple of others that I'd like to just mention uh, because I think they're, they're embedded, but they haven't been pulled out until recently as identifiable subjects. Uh, the first one is integration of technology. It has been a discussion in schools for a long, long time. Uh, when slide projectors first showed up or overhead projectors, that was integration of technology. Uh, and I think that there are all of a sudden with uh, handheld devices and social media, all kinds of opportunities and probably problems as well that are going to arise in schools as a result. I haven't yet seen the architectural expression of that really fulfilled, but I expect to pretty soon. Um, an example that I was talking to my class about the other day is the uh, Apple Store, which really knows how to display technology. Like, like a Montessori school would love that, where you go for the learning tools. Uh, and the building itself is kind of nothing. It's background. So the, the school becomes the frame, and the technology becomes the picture, something like that. Another one is sustainability, and like I was saying, daylighting, natural ventilation, uh, site development perhaps less so, although outdoor learning certainly has been a big issue in schools for well over 100 years. Uh, Petzolozzi in the early 19th century was saying that for kindergarten you have to have outdoor space. That's where kids learn is outside. So how you, how you then take that and give it architectural expression I think some of the examples I've shown already do that, but I think there are uh, a lot of examples that are starting to appear now that really are looking at exploiting the school facility itself as a learning tool for sustainability. So it, it teaches you something about the world similar to the way Dwyker School teaches you something about healthy living. It doesn't just tell you that, it shows it to you and, and you get it because you're there in that environment day in and day out. And that's, for me, the real test of, of the architectural expression is does, in a school anyway, is does it fulfill an educational objective? So open it up for questions or comments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, displayed walls in the hallway. How does that impact the rooms that are associated on the outside of the hallway? Are they all they're, in or are they? They're, for, they're formed by it. The, from inside the hallway, it opens outward. And in the classrooms, it leans in and contains. And so the, the classroom is more, more contained and has kind of a protective feeling along that, that corridor side. 
and that splayed wall then picks up the angle of the roof that then carries down and, and uh, it's, it's a nice uh, organization with the, the pitched roofs. They sheet drain uh, rainwater off those roofs so when it's raining it's like a waterfall and it's collected in trenches along the south side of the building where it's filtered and then stored in cisterns for use in student gardens. So there's a whole literal connection. I mean, each one of these schools, of course, you could do a, a talk on. But I like the Pat Cal's work uh, for the sustainability aspect of them. And it's, it's very expressive architecturally, but it also has a lot of the technical things mastered. Um, I was talking to John Pat Cow about that and the educational objectives of the school in general. And, and he sort of at some point paused and said, you know, sometimes we forget that schools are really about education. It's not just about sustainability. You have to take that and turn it into an educational subject, I think. Otherwise, it's going to be engineering, which is good too. That's fine. But it doesn't go the next step that makes it truly architectural. Yeah, it, it varies. You know, European schools, all of the schools I looked at were by important design architects. That's sort of my starting point. I wanted to know, I wanted to see architecture of real design quality. And so that, that was my starting point. And when I started, I thought design architects hadn't really designed schools. They, they deemed them unworthy somehow. Mm -hmm. Turns out almost all of them had. And um, in, in Europe, those are protected. And so it's probably a bit harder to say because they won't let you do too much to them. But here, they're not protected at all. And it's, it's kind of open season. But I found that there were a lot of schools, and certainly all of these that I've shown you, that are really in pretty good original condition. There were a number that had been torn down fairly recently, some of them. We lost a Paul Rudolph school about two years ago in Sarasota, Florida. That was a real shame. It was his first major building. And a wonderful school for sustainability. It was um, a school that could be opened up for cross ventilation. And they wanted a school that was air conditioned. So he actually had two schools in that town. And they saved one of them and demolished the other one. But I think that's a sad loss. You know, Maybe it's dysfunctional in terms of building systems and those that that is a very difficult era, the 50s, for renovating because everything's exposed. You know, there's not much room to work with. But, um, you know, I, I think that in general, if I found a school that was so badly altered that it just showed that it didn't work, and there are, for example, a lot of open classroom schools that just never really made it. Although even that, I did find a couple that did work and that we're still in original condition that they really, uh, the, the teachers and students really liked. So, yeah. Can you say a little bit about the project that's on the curve? Uh, this is uh, Gunter Banish's last school, which was done, uh, it's also in Lorch. It's next to the school that I showed you. And uh, I like this school very much uh, because it goes back to some early themes in his work looking at very simple organizations uh, that have just a few moves that break out of that and, and make the kind of uh, situational connections that he's talking about. In this case, all the classrooms, there are 10 or 12 of them organized around uh, a central space like a donut. And it's, it's kind of unusual for a school because we're so used to the finger plan school or pavilion school where you optimize your orientation so that all of the classrooms face south. Well, obviously, he's facing all directions. Well, he then comes back in with an automated, computer automated screening system that has actually been used in Germany for many, many years. And 
he makes micro adjustments to each classroom. And it's amazing, when I took this photograph, those were actually retracting. So you get clouds coming over and all of a sudden they go up automatically. It's like it's breathing. It's quite amazing. And I asked the teacher if that bothered her and she said, we got used to it and they can override it if they don't like it. But um, he then responds very directly to the landscape and the site with different wings below that are doing different things for different kind of classrooms or meeting spaces or administration or whatever. But I like that kind of idealized perfect form that goes against just about everything you're told about school design and it works because he's thinking about the right thing. Yeah, every school's different, and it's not just by country either. Uh, you, you'll find if, if you design schools, schools have really different cultures. Like, you know, you'll, you might even think they're the same, like a, say a suburban context, and you think, oh, they're, they're going to be the same. One might turn out to be, like, meticulous about cleaning up, you know, after themselves, and others is just like trash everywhere. And you start moving, you know, internationally, and... I can't say that I see a difference between German schools and Dutch schools and Swedish schools, but or American schools for that matter, in, in the way they inhabit the spaces. Uh, and in fact, there's quite a bit of overlap in borrowing historically going back and forth. So I, I don't know about that. Have you had any experience with it? Demi, is that a? Uh, I was just curious. I didn't see anything sort of the East Coast here in the United States, if they were harder on no, uh, on the East Coast, the, historically, the, the great school designers were the Architects Collaborative. Um, Perkins and Will did a lot of school work in the East Coast, Midwest, Upper Midwest and East Coast. And uh, they definitely have different variations based on the climate. Or uh, Caudell Rollett Scott, Bill Caudell's schools in the Southwest, very different uh, from those in the North. So the responsiveness, I think, is less cultural and more just to the, the climate and the context, the physical context. Yeah? Uh, sort of a two-part question, but the Sharon School, mm -hmm. can you talk a bit about what the context of that was? I mean, I was seeing this interesting church tower in the background. Oh. It's hard to sort of tell. It was, well, Lunan is a, it's a, a historic town, fairly small. And this is a neighborhood development that's just off on the edge of it that developed after the Second World War. And the, uh, the church directly across the street was not related to the school directly, but it is part of the community. There isn't any kind of zoning that set them up to go together. But um, the, the general planning of the school, and there was actually to be a second school adjacent to it that Sharon was supposed to design, and that was not granted to him for some reason. I don't know. I don't know why he didn't get that commission. But um, that's an interesting thing, too. It's not a very good school, I think. And um, I was talking to a teacher who was telling me that the biggest problem they have when, when kids leave their school, they have to go across to the other school. And they thought all schools were supposed to be like Han Sharon schools, and they're not. And they're kind of sad about that. I mean, the Sharon schools are just so incredibly varied and rich and you you move back into a normal school and you know cord double loaded corridors and you know it's it's pretty grim yeah what, you said the historically the classrooms were 28 by 32 i mean what have you noticed about the scale of the classroom and yeah. also the scale of the school size well the, okay, scale of the schools, you know, there's a big movement afoot for small schools. And in a lot of places, that's boiling down to schools within a school, which is a sleight of hand, really. But small schools, I mean, there's been an imperative for that for a long time. In Switzerland, that was mandated, I think, back in the 20s or 30s at least, that kindergarten and primary schools couldn't have more than, I think, four classrooms. And so they have a lot of little bitty schools. Well, administratively, we're not willing to do that, and it's too expensive. 
And so you're, you typically don't see it go to that extent. Uh, but there's definitely a tendency to get away from large schools. And you know, the size of the classroom even, traditional schools had 50 or 60 students in them. And you know, the, the desks were bolted to the floor so that you couldn't move them around and make a mess out of it. The hierarchy, well, we laugh, right? But you know, this is it. I mean, it's still done. It has some uses. But um, yeah, the, there were also very large schools in the, the first quarter of the 20th century, like in New York City, very large schools, kind of scary large, four or 5,000 kids. And uh, California still has huge schools. But um, you know, that's, that's a trade-off between the amenities of a large school and the, the, the scope. It's like living in a big city. The scope of things you get versus the anonymity and confusion and all the other things that come from you know, lack of organization, if that exists. So, um, but the, just talking about the classroom size, that, that was very strictly adhered to. There were you know, norms and uh, so forth, guidelines, for how to design classrooms. And uh, you know, where the light came from, it was and, and air exchanges in the classroom pretty early on, turn of the century. Um, yeah, you know, I think the, the classroom, like I say, there has been there have been efforts to do away with the classroom. It keeps coming back as as a unit that we relate to for whatever reason, and it's not going to get much smaller except in a private school because of the cost, and it's probably not going to get much bigger because it, it goes out of control for the kind of things that you're trying to do now in schools. It's not like lecturing to 50 or 60 people, which is manageable. But if you have 50 or 60 people doing hands-on activities, it's, that's too much. I suppose in, in making a book like this, you have to eliminate some examples and include others. But two, two examples, which, which are my favorites, maybe you've included them in your book. One of them is uh, Tarangi School in Como, yeah. in Zilo. And the other is uh, Van Eyck's uh, Orphanage, which is also a school. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering, wh where, do you, where do you include and when, when do you exclude? Is there yeah. a typology that is at the base of your investigation? Yeah. Um, the book is, is divided into two sections. And the first part is a survey. And the survey is, I think, 110 schools, something like that. And yes, Taranyi is included. And that's, I haven't seen that school, uh, but it looks amazing. And um, the Van Eyck Orphanage I thought about, but I didn't include. Instead, I included uh, one of his schools in Nyla, which is a, really a school. The orphanage is a little bit of a cheat because it has the living environment with it. And, I have been in that building, and I didn't like it very much. It's, it's pretty, I haven't seen it since it's been renovated as, as a school, as an architecture school, I believe. Is that correct? I've never visited oh, it. It's, it's pretty, pretty dreary. Uh, but the, his other schools, which were very um, influential, uh, especially for Hertzberger, you can see in Hertzberger's Delft School, which is one of his most important uh, projects, not just schools, but projects. You can see Van Eyck's, you know, his floor plan is basically the starting point, as well as the idea of these zones of exchange between inside and outside, between public and private. That's really essential to his ideas. Um, I, I guess I like the, the Taranyi because of the openness and transparency. The classrooms um, can be interconnected with operable walls by opening up operable walls. That was 1935, and that's something that you know, we still do today to try and get flexibility built into the school. There he did it with a series of four or five classrooms that could be interconnected. They can also be opened up to the hallway, which then opens up to the courtyard. So the expansiveness of that space is really remarkable, at least in photographs. So, uh, just to correct Esther, one little thing. I didn't visit every one of these schools. I, I visited a lot of them. 
Uh, some of them are gone, so I couldn't. And some of them, the 20% of photographs that aren't mine are because I couldn't get the photographs. But um, most of those were because they were either destroyed or just inaccessible to me. Yeah. But I, I personally, I, I love documenting architecture, and I love analyzing it. And I, I think whenever possible, it's, you should get to it. You should see it in person and just get a, a sense for how it works in schools especially because you can't, if you go there, they'll let you see and observe how the spaces are used, but you can't photograph it. So if you only see the photographs, you're left sort of scratching your head going, gee, that looks like an empty space, not a busy, bustling school. Um, yeah, that, that's another one that that one I almost didn't get to. I found out about it very late. I thought Corbusier had not done a school, and um, except La Tourette, which is a special kind of school. But um, my wife and I were reading the Sunday New York Times, and as I was getting close to compiling all of this stuff and and getting it together to send off. And she says, did you know that Corbusier designed a school? And I said, no, he didn't. And she said, yes, he did. And I said, no, he didn't. And she says, well, here it is in the New York Times travel section. <laughs> so I had to run off to Fairmany to see that one. And it was, a, it was a good thing I did. It's an amazing school. And um, I was showing it to uh, John Habrakan, who I know pretty well. And John took one look at it. And he's no fan of Corbusier's, but he said, the hand of the master I mean, the, the integration of color and light is sublime. And it's probably, I would say, very close to Corb's last project. It's um, interesting because it's a, a kindergarten and primary school located on the 19th floor of you know, a 500 unit housing block. And it was used up until 1990. It's been out of use for a while, but they're soon going to start using it again, they think which I think would be great, and it's, it's being kept in beautiful conditions. So that's really worth seeing if you ever have the opportunity. If you go to see the church at Fairmany, definitely go see the housing block in the, in the kindergarten. Echo Matronel. Yeah, I have a question about the Corbusier School. Thank you. Well, thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks. I think I know you. Yes, from uh, Frank Montana land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from Michigan.